The show is here. Yo, our mission is clear. It's time to change health care. Have no fear. Today is the day. This is the hour. Together, you know we've got the power. Drop the silos. We're all the same team. Patients, docs, nurses, tech, and marketing. How can anyone be satisfied with the way things have always been? Yeah, we've tried. So join us now. Join the revolution. Digital health is the evolution. Status quo, more like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rap. Y'all, come on, let's go. New choices, new platforms, new care models. In the healthcare of tomorrow, consumers win. But who will design it? What will it look like? And how long will it take? We're here to answer those questions with some provocative thinking about how to create the healthcare that people actually want. Ready to roll up your sleeves, look at the world a little differently, and explore the frontiers of consumer health together? Join us. This is the Healthcare Wrap. Welcome back. It's time for more provocative thinking about the healthcare of tomorrow. I'm your host, Jared Johnson. If you're just now joining us, we hope you'll follow us and check out our previous episodes, all 200 of them. We're in season seven where we're writing the consumer health playbook and answering three important questions. Who will design it? What will it look like? And how long will it take? Let us know what you think about this episode and what topics you're dying to hear about in future episodes by reaching out on LinkedIn or Twitter at Healthcare Wrap. So here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about the lessons I learned from the Creator Economy Expo. What can healthcare learn from content entrepreneurs? I'll talk about that. Then Dr. Fassel Syed is in the house. Fassel is the National Director for Primary Care at Chen Med, and he's here to talk about how healthcare changes when we address primary care from outside the world of RVUs and fee-for-service. Chen Med is doing amazing things for underserved seniors, and you'll hear all about it. Let's do this. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the Week. Are there lessons for healthcare organizations from the creator economy? I recently attended the first ever Creator Economy Expo hosted by Joe Polizzi and Brian Clark. The conference is for content creators who want to be content entrepreneurs, and as you can expect, that draws a highly diverse community together. There were probably about 400 to 500 people in attendance. I sat next to people at all points in their creator journeys, from B2B and B2C industries, content managers to YouTubers, sports jackets sitting next to Bermuda shorts. The vibe was off the charts, in part because we came in without knowing what to expect. It was also in part because of the chance to meet people like Joe Polizzi, Robert Rose, Jeremiah Aoyang, and Brian Fanzo and so many others in a smaller, more personable setting where they each took the time to chat with me and offer encouragement and gratitude. Over the course of the conference, I found three themes that were particularly relevant to healthcare organizations. First, Jeremiah Al Yang, an outspoken advocate of Web3 technologies such as DAOs, NFTs, and creator coins, presented on how the internet is moving to a peer-to-peer model, meaning instead of building an audience, we should think of it as building a community. The future is not one person building up their own brand and trying to get everyone to engage with them to build their brand. It's building decentralized communities where the power is democratized and we're incentivized to contribute knowledge and trust one another. Second, in the quest for creators to connect with their community, and accomplish their goals, whether it be to grow a business or influence society. Creators learn to focus everything on telling stories that connect with people. They spend an inordinate amount of time and energy trying to engage through those stories. In that quest, they listen to the point of view of the members of their community. They understand their hopes and dreams, their expressed and unexpressed needs and desires, and the successful ones create all of their content around those needs. Third, creators are embracing the future without relinquishing the past. The biggest evidence of this was in the four tracks or focus areas for the session, which were operations, web three, revenue, and audience. Sound familiar? Isn't that remarkably close to the four pillars of the Consumer First Health Group that we talk about frequently on this program? Human-centered design, digital, finance, and marketing. This balance shows me that we don't have to abandon what got us here, but we should still feel the urgency to explore what's coming, and we should create a safe space that allows us to fail along the way, or else we might not develop the chops we need. Healthcare, we have a long way to go, but these lessons can help us get there faster. Change agents, I'm talking to you. Content creators are doing amazing things, and they're doing it by leaning on peer-to-peer communities, telling powerful stories, and embracing the future. It's time to think like content entrepreneurs. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the Flava of the Week. The flow, the flow, the flow. 
flow. All right, everyone, let's get into the flow. I've got a special treat for you. Give it up for Dr. Fassel Syed. He's the National Director for Primary Care at Chen Med. He's also the host of Fassel and Friends. It's a primary care podcast. You really should check that out. I want to welcome you, Fassel, to the Healthcare Wrap. How are you doing? Hi, Jared. Thank you so much for having me on today. Wow. Uh, what did I miss in your bio? Let's start there. What else would you like our listeners to know about you and your background? Well, you know, I really can't remember a time when I didn't you know, want to be a doctor. I have a uh, interesting, you know, my, I was raised by my, my parents. My father is a retired inventor. And so he has over 20 technical patents. And so I grew up in a home where I really felt like there was, there was nothing that was off the table. You know, he has the patents for caller ID, voice recognition, a bunch of neat technical patents. It was a great childhood from that perspective. And then I had my mother, who was the opposite extreme, who was very passionate about natural remedies. And I remember the way my mother used to question doctors. You know, the doctors would offer some sort of medical advice, and then my mom would always come back with a, with a natural remedy. So in addition to whatever professionally, you know, I'm a community doctor. I, I trained in family medicine. And after completing my training in family medicine, I went into community health. So I became a doctor specifically for people with little to no resources. Well, I imagine that served you quite well in your role right now, but I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the newest brand ambassador for Chen Med. Do you want to tell us what your life has been like for the last few weeks? Yeah, so I'm, I'm at the stage of life right now where my seven-week-old son, Elias, gets me out of bed in the morning at two o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, I guess. <laughs> So I'm at that stage of life. And, uh, you know, this is being a father again at 42 versus the first time when I was 28 is very, very different. I definitely appreciate the experience much more now at 42 than than I did at 28. Actually, you know, a benefit that I have now that I didn't have the first time around is actually at my company, we have paid paternity leave. So I was able to take off work for a month on paid paternity leave without worrying about anything related to my job or my professional life and just focus on being a father. And actually that ended up working out very nicely because we ended up having, he, my our, our son ended up having difficulty with breathing and with feeding. And so he ended up needing to stay in the ICU for over two weeks, for the first two weeks of his life. He's fine now, he's home with us now. But on top of dealing with everything going on in my personal life, having the time away and not worrying about my work or my paycheck was, you know, it's no surprise that the company I work for has um, received the best place to work award two years in a row. Well, I'll tell you what, I love hearing anything about paternity leave. I, I will tell you just in this world right now where it feels like uh, things like that make a difference for employees because I don't even use that term employees that much anymore. It's like we're we're people who happen to be working in a place. Yeah. And, and so like that difference, I can only imagine that that made things, I, I mean, what would have been like without that type of leave? I don't feel like an employee. I can tell I mean, even before going on leave, I, Chen Med's one of those companies, we're fortunate that it's a family run business and it very much feels like, you know, I'm working with my family members. And so I love the company before but even now, I appreciate it even more now because I'm valued. You know, my my time is valued. Me as a human being, my family relationship. You can when you really need it. When the company will do things like this, I mean, this is what really makes ties you to the organization, ties you to the mission. Well, I'll tell you what, let's dig into that mission here because one thing I'm very interested in is understanding how disruptors like ChenMed are just approaching healthcare differently. We speak with a lot of guests on this program, and I think the one thing that unites all of them is this, this change agent mentality. I don't have a better word for it. I'm sure there's a better term for it, but not just from the guests, but the organizations they work for. And there is a big difference in the type of mindset for an organization like ChenMed because it's very clear that you're, you're working on providing a better experience and that you're very consumer focused. I imagine there's varying levels from our listeners of, of understanding and familiarity of what ChenMed is and what they do and why it's different. Maybe we should start there with an, a layperson's explanation of, of uh, what ChenMed is all about. Sure. ChenMed serves underserved seniors. You know, so we're not your typical transactional primary care practice. We're, ChenMed is a full risk primary care provider. So our patients are some of the oldest, sickest, and probably most forgotten members of society. The age we're talking about 
our patients on average are over 70 years old and they have five or more chronic medical conditions at the same time. Most of them are on fixed incomes. And many of them actually did not have access to primary care because you know, our healthcare delivery system, most of healthcare delivery in the United States is the fee for service world. So they're not, patients who live in underserved neighborhoods aren't profitable. They don't generate a lot of billing opportunities. And so we honor these seniors with affordable VIP care that delivers better health. Our clinicians, that what they do is they're focused on the patient's needs. So they meet the patient's needs where their needs exist. And that includes things like food, housing, and even transportation needs. So in our mind, you know, when most people think of primary care, they think of, you know, wellness visits, referral, renewals to go see specialists, getting your medications refilled. But in our minds, you know, public health is our space. You know, urgent care is our space. You know, we don't refer most of the non-interventional specialty care, actually. We are focused on transforming the lives of our patients and ultimately entire communities. So the goal is to improve health rather than to bill more. So it's It feels like a much more ethical healthcare delivery system. It sounds like even just the approach you're sharing with words like talking about the mission and and how ethical that is, there's got to be a a business side to that as well, which we'll dive into. But I think it's fascinating that that's the approach to begin with. What we've been talking about lately, especially on the program, is how do consumers understand all the choices that are out there now? And they keep changing. So how do they keep up? How do they trust those options and know what's best for them? I think it's fair to say that a majority of consumers out there don't understand the complexity of the current healthcare system. I've yeah. been in the in in the industry for going on two decades, <laughs> and I don't understand a lot of it. And I think consumers take that one step further. They they don't understand it, but they also don't really care that much. They just want a better experience. They want this to make sense and fit within the needs that they have in their life. So I'm curious how the team at ChenMed designs a better experience that meets those needs. It's interesting you mentioned about the mission and, you know, the speaking from the moral side of things. You know, we have to, we start from this moral consensus, right? Our mission is actually we, we honor seniors with affordable VIP care that delivers better health. And so when you have a physician-led practice, and we are a physician-led practice, and we believe that everyone should have equal access to healthcare, regardless of their financial circumstances in their lives. You know, so we are intentionally growing in underserved communities. And so we're just not providing your typical primary care. What we're providing is care that actually we're calling it transformative care. So, you know, to do like a quick compare and contrast, like in the fee for service world, you know, most patients see their doctors, maybe they see the doctors once or twice per year. In our world, we see our patients as often as necessary. At, on the, at a bare minimum, routine visits are on a monthly basis because I told you earlier, you know, we're dealing with seniors. Our average patient's over 70 years old. They're very medically complex. You know, you're talking five or more chronic medical conditions. So they need to be seen on a regular basis. You know, in the fee-for-service world, appointments are very quick. Our appointments take, we spend much more time with our patients, you know, at least 20 minutes. You know, new patient visits at least 40 minutes. And really as often and as long as you need. In the fee-for-service world, I think about, you know, with what I'm dealing with right now with my seven-week-old who had a, a, a rough start. You know, when I get a text message from the doctor's office, really it's that, you know, I've got an appointment coming up or I owe money. <laughs> In our world, our patients actually get daily text messages on ways that they can improve their health. There's a difference. In the fee-for-service world, when we walk out of the doctor's office, Maybe you walk out with a prescription, but in, in our world, actually, our, our patients walk out with their actual medication in their hands. So you see, in our, in our world, you know, our patients end up spending between 30 to 50 percent less time in the hospital than in the fee-for-service world. And they actually end up living on average five or more years longer as well. Stay tuned for more provocative thinking after the break. <laughs> 
Hey, listen up, y'all. Did you know that nearly 60% of people wish their healthcare provider sent them more relevant health information? And 42% would even consider switching to a different provider that sent them more, according to a recent survey of patients in the U.S. The vast majority of them would prefer to get that information via email or text. Persado is a natural language AI company that provides healthcare organizations with pre-developed, pre-optimized messaging journeys proven to build digital relationships, improve health goals, and increase patient retention. Deliver better health outcomes and revenue growth with Persado's data-driven content that inspires action. Visit persado.com to learn more. That's persado, P-E-R-S-A-D-O.com to find out how Persado can help. Justin Knott here with the Patient Convert Podcast, your weekly dose of healthcare marketing growth strategies, co-hosted by Justin and Kelly Knott. This is perfect for physicians, practice owners, healthcare entrepreneurs, and healthcare executives. We are breaking down what practices and healthcare organizations should be doing to grow, reach, and retain patients. There's so much confusion and so many options out there around what you should be focusing on to grow your practice, and we're breaking down each week what really works. We're bringing real-world application, case studies, and interviews from leading growth-minded physicians and healthcare executives. So catch us weekly on your favorite listening platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google. Okay, back to the flow. So with something as as seemingly simple as just providing more more time during appointments? Absolutely. You know, it's a relationship-based care model of care delivery. It's not a transactional model. It's a relationship-based model. You know, we you know, the doctor-patient relationship is a sacred one in our model. It used to be a sacred one before it became the transactional one that everyone knows today, unfortunately. So I guess, you know, one question that comes to mind is like, why hasn't someone done this before? It makes so much sense. What have been the obstacles to this type of model coming to play before? You know, like, why hasn't someone done this before? Well, it's a, it's a heavy question. We're in an evolution. You know, we've been consistently in an evolution. You know, healthcare is constantly changing. And the healthcare delivery in the country has been based on a transactional model up until very recently, up until the last couple of decades, meaning that you know, up until very recently, you have to pay. Basically, healthcare delivery is based on your ability to pay. Unless you go to the emergency room, you have to pay to go see a doctor. The cost of care, you have to take the cost of care into consideration with your experience with uh, your interacting interactions with the healthcare delivery system. But now, but now we have options. You know, now we have different levels of risk arrangements. And you have organizations like ChenMed we're able to take on full risk. And when you take on full risk and you're responsible for the total dollar care, you know, for every hospitalization, for every medication, for every aspect of care delivery, then suddenly your goal becomes to influence positive behavior changes to improve health. And improving health in general means three things, right? Improving health means prevention of disease. Improving health means curing of disease. And when you can't do either, improving health means easing of suffering. So then everyone's aligned with the goal of improving health rather than to bill more. I see. And I imagine that attracts certain types of clinicians as opposed to others. I mean, that draws in some who are, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, more mission-based, you know, and understand the value of what they're doing. And that feels right. And I'm sure there are some who are just more familiar with or just more comfortable with the fee-for-service world that they've either gotten accustomed to or they've been practicing in, you know, for, like you said, until very recently. How does that come into play in terms of bringing more providers on board? Does it attract a certain type of provider? Well, you know, we're living in a time right now where we're experiencing physician burnout and nursing care burnout, really just healthcare delivery burnout at a level. I mean, and it got, you know, it all got got so much worse because of COVID. But now, especially if you're talking about primary care, the burnout is very, very real. Patients are being delivered like in a parade to the doctors and the doctors are just in and out with the patients. You know, the goal is to just get patients in, you know, patients are seen for a few minutes and then off the patients go. And the ones who are 
who are running this system, you know, they keep figuring out ways for doctors to see patients faster and to see more patients. You know, the goal is, you know, to treat them and treat them. You know, this environment of just treating patients and letting them run out. You know, our priority is actually to influence patients to make better choices, you know, that ultimately results in better health outcomes. So the goal is to, I mean, at least with the work, a lot of the work that I try to do for the company and for medicine in general is, is to help educate doctors that, hey, there's options outside of the billing model. You know, you can be in a model where you have teams that are supporting you to do all the work that doctors, just because a doctor can do something, doesn't mean that the doctor should be doing that. I think the value proposition, to use a marketing term, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. How do you translate that to help an underserved senior understand that like, this is the choice that they can trust? This is a choice worth them exploring and, and checking out to see if it's right for them? With patients, I think about what, you know, when you're, when you're looking at your average 70 plus year old person, when they think of the relationship between their doctor and themselves, you know, they don't immediately think of a billing relationship. You know, that our patients don't view doctors as just, you know, as a, in a transactional sort of manner. You know, our patients view their doctor as the first person that they go to whenever there's a problem. You know, if they're constipated, they call us. If it's double toe, they call us. You know, if they can't sleep, they call us. And I, I know that may sound silly, because we're used to this sterile transactional process in, in our healthcare delivery system. But actually, when you develop these types of relationships, then you start to build trust in the healthcare delivery system. And then, then everyone is on the same page, and our goal is to improve health. You know, and, and, and our patients want that opinion too. You know, the patients want the doctor who knows them best. They don't want to go to the emergency room and have to re-give their entire list of their medications and to remember all that stuff and to remember what they're allergic to and to remember test results and things like that. They would rather have the person who knows them best look after them. And I know, and, and from the doctor's side, I remember I would feel betrayed if a patient went to the emergency room without talking to me first. <laughs> I would say, hey, what could I have done? Why, did, why didn't you call me? Because I know that, that there's no one who knows my patient's better than I do. You know, you can't just apply a cookie cutter type of, hey, you know, this is a protocol, this patient, because then the patients just become a diagnosis and they fall into like some sort of protocol rather than being a human being with complex social and medical needs. Well, that makes a huge difference, uh, doesn't it? Uh, a huge difference to see consumers and patients differently, like you described. I think that's a, a major hallmark of this, this approach and why it's growing. I wonder if you can give us a, a bit of a reality check if we kind of take a step back and just talk about the industry at large, not just what ChenMed is doing to make a difference. What kind of progress do you think we can realistically expect out there in the industry? We've talked about some of the, the things you're trying to do to improve an experience, to improve access, to improve a relationship, what kind of progress can we realistically expect? Let's say like the next one to two years. Well, the reality check is not really a pretty picture right now. You know, America is the world's richest country. But sadly, we have we still have almost 30 million Americans who live every day without health care. I mean, if you compare the United States with Japan, for example, we spend almost three times more per person on health care than what the country of Japan does. And, you know, the life expectancy in America is 37, 38 in Japan. I mean, their life expectancy is six or more years longer than what it is over here. Their average, the average Japanese person is almost 50 years old. So we're spending nearly twice as much as most developed countries. And still, we, end, we have probably some of the highest chronic disease burden when you compare that to any other country. I mean, if you just look at the obesity rate in America, you know, it's more than double what it is in other countries. And so the people who are running this transactional billing focus, like the sick care sort of system, when if you generate more profit from inefficiencies or from more complications, you know, then you actually make a lot of money. You know, if you, if you for example, if you just, if you pick on influenza vaccination, Influenza vaccination rates in the country, we haven't crossed with American adults, we haven't crossed the 47, 48, maybe 49 percent mark as a country with influenza vaccinations. If we had higher influenza vaccination rates as a country, if the system was incentivized to encourage or to inspire people or to influence people to get better vaccinated against influenza, that would result 
in fewer complications from influenza, right? That would result in fewer needs for patients to be going with complications from influenza to the emergency room, fewer needs of patients getting actually admitted in the hospital, fewer needs of complications getting to the ICU. And so our system actually generates more profits when, when you don't address these issues further upstream. And it's actually quite distracting most people from focusing on what really matters, which is what which is helping people live longer and healthier lives in our world. In our world, I mean, I in New Orleans, we have centers in the zip code where the life expectancy is only 54, 56. You could probably argue that that's probably one of the most prevention hesitant populations in the country, right? But with so far as influenza vaccination rates are concerned, our doctors consistently get 97, 98, 99% of their patients vaccinated against influenza and probably the most prevention hesitant population. So you can, there's hope there. I see in the next couple of years, I see ChenMed and, and other fully capitated healthcare providers. I mean, I see that we're trying, but if you look at, you know, the healthcare delivery system now, it's like this, if you look at it like this $4 trillion fully loaded cargo ship, in our mind, this cargo ship is running in the wrong direction. So it's going to take some time to influence that rudder to kind of move back in the right direction, right? When we only make up a small little corner of that cargo ship's probably smallest container, you know, still, you know, a small percentage of healthcare delivery is taking on full risk. Well, I like that line of thinking just because I've seen the line of thinking in the opposite direction of if a solution doesn't solve everything, the entire quote unquote <laughs> industry, then, it, then it's not worth pursuing. And it's like, no, we, we're going to need a combination of many different solutions yeah. solving many different problems all at once. And there will be a network effect because of that, but there's not an easy button here. And there's no one thing that's going to address all of the inequities and challenges and issues that we've got here. So I like that line of thinking just because it's, to me, it's going to take more focus, not less. Yes. We have the generation of physicians now and doctors and nurses who believe that health equity equals social justice. You know, so we have that belief, you know, that so we, in my mind, the more that we can spread the full risk model or the value-based care model and shift more towards results focused, like a, a healthcare delivery system that's more focused on having healthier outcomes, then we can create more social justice. I love that. I love that thought. Are there other trends that you're paying attention to right now? Well, right now, I mean, of course, you know, I just going to admit health equity. We got to take the finances out of the equation. You know, we must treat everyone the same. And that includes, you know, increased access, like you mentioned before. We got to provide high quality medical care to anyone who needs it. But, you know, here's the problem. Most of the outpatient practices are owned by these big hospital systems. So they're building medical centers in much more affluent neighborhoods. And, and, and so we have to remember, you know, we have, you know, what about the poor and the rural areas? You know, these people need high quality care too. And, you know, I'm also very worried about medical debt and bankruptcy. Since we've been home these last couple of weeks from, the, from Elias being born at the hospital, my, my baby being born in the hospital, already we're getting medical bills are coming and actually some of them have already gone to debt collection. You know, some of the things from my, my wife's, you know, care. And it's hard to believe that in the richest country in the world, the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States is medical debt. And the worst thing about these, you know, about this situation is that more than half the people who declare bankruptcy because of medical debt, they had insurance. So all these issues go away when you change the currency of healthcare delivery. You know, the, the currency of healthcare delivery right now you got to bill more to generate more RVUs. You know, so when you when you change the currency from generating RVUs and suddenly your currency now is to improve health, then you keep healthy people from getting sick. You focus on prevention, things like the vaccines, screenings, checkups, and then ultimately you end up easing suffering and you you achieve a much more ethical healthcare delivery system. You know, we we can't have that. And companies like ChenMed are growing like crazy. I mean, we're this year we're adding 30 new centers you know, in new markets and existing markets as well. And next year, I know we're going to be adding 50 or so more new centers next year. But we need doctors. You know, we need good doctors. We need doctors 
who want to remember why they went into medicine in the first place. And then you can practice medicine the way that you thought before you get eaten alive in the, in the billing model. Well, I want to honor you first and foremost in, of just applying the personal experience that you and your family have had and internalizing that and applying that to the work you're trying to do. I think that's that's very honorable here. Anything that we haven't covered, anything else that, that you'd want our listeners to know about? Well, I mean, especially for the doctors or people who know doctors, I mean, if you're like me, you've always imagined what ideal healthcare looks like. And for me, it's such a relief to be working in an organization that has a moral vision. It's not something that we gloss over here. So ChenMed has a moral vision and I believe that ChenMed is delivering ideal healthcare, and I believe that ChenMed is transforming healthcare in America. Well, Fasal, I want to thank you again for giving us so much time. What's the best way for listeners to connect with you? Hey, we have a wonderful website. You go to ChenMed.com, and you can click. You can have the physician experience. You can go have a patient experience. We have from there. You can navigate through. We've got a bunch of content there. Great content. We've got our our blog that has there's so much great information there to learn about having a relationship-based healthcare delivery system that relies heavily on teamwork and relationships at large. You know, we're trying to restore the doctor-patient relationship. We're also restoring the doctor-to-doctor relationship and the doctor-to-staff relationship. So there's a lot of great content out there on our website. So please, if you can find us on social media, follow Chen Med on your social media and then go to our website as well. A lot of great content there. Fantastic. And I will plug the podcast one more time. It's called Fassel and Friends, a primary care podcast. So check that out too. Uh, Thanks again so much for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening. We hope you found some value in this conversation. And if you did, do us a favor and follow us using your favorite podcast app. Then tell your friends and colleagues about us. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Healthcare App is a member of the Shift.Health Content Network. If you enjoyed this podcast, you're going to love the other shows in the Shift.Health Content Network. Go check out the latest show. In fact, it's called Hello Healthcare, hosted by Chris Hemphill. It's focused on people who are moving healthcare forward, how healthcare strategy relates to data and AI, and what you can do to create or demand a better future. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or at Shift.Health, where all 35 podcasts and video series are free and available on demand. Until next time, keep marketing forward. Thanks. And that's a wrap.